Well, welcome to week two of our trauma-informed parenting series. Um, so last week, we started this conversation about getting to know ourselves. You know, when, when you're parenting, there's, there's really two halves of this. There's the, the child part, and then there's the parent part. And for these first couple of weeks, we're really going to focus on ourselves as parents, getting to know yourself, getting to know how your attachment styles impact your parenting right now. Um, and tonight, we're going to look at how you handle stress, how you handle emotional things that, that come your way, those stressors, those frustrations, the highs, the lows, all of it. We're going to look at how that impacts the body and the brain, and we're going to get a really firm grasp as to what that looks like and, uh, and actually have some tools to walk away from this class with to, to actually try to get to that place of a good self, self-regulation. And as we're, we're thinking about that, we're going to go ahead and start off with our, our parenting um, mindfulness moment number two. So this one is a good one for this week because it, it is going to talk a little bit about stress and managing stress, um, but it doesn't have to be stress. It can be any emotion. So for, for this activity, what I want you to do is kind of think of emotion and emotion that, that might need a little bit of, of containment for you. Now, and I want you to hear me. And what I'm not saying that emotions are bad or that they're wrong. Emotions are super important, and they inform us on the world around us and what needs to happen for us and what needs to happen for our kids. However, sometimes those emotions can get so big and so unwieldy that it makes it very difficult for us to hear the message that they're trying to tell us. So what this exercise is all about is not pushing our feelings down or getting rid of our feelings. What it is, is it's about kind of bringing those feelings into sharper focus, containing them in such a way that we can really get curious about them and take a look at at what they might be trying to tell us and inform us about. So I want you to kind of get, get in a comfortable space uh, if, you, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, that works really, really well. Um, kind of put your hands in a, in a comfortable space. If you want to put your books down for right now, that's fine. You can put your legs on the, uh, hands on the tops of your legs, either up or down is fine or crossed is, is fine as well. And I want to mention that if at any point this starts to feel uncomfortable to you, um, just, talk, just, just go to the breathing, just listen to your breathing and just re- take some good deep cleansing breaths. Or you can go back to your butterfly hug. So if you start to feel uncomfortable and would, would need some, some kind of uh, relaxation or you're having difficulty containing the emotion that you're trying to contain, that's okay. You know, it's, it's letting you know that it's awfully big. Just go to the, the, the simple one. Just go to the butterfly hug and you'll, you'll be in a good space. So get in that nice, comfortable place. Close your eyes if you'd like. And what I'd want you to do is, is identify a strong feeling that you would like to spend some time with and contain. So it could be, come on in, guys. It could be a feeling of, of frustration that you've felt because of something that's happened earlier today. It can be that feeling of, I just feel really distracted right now. It could be, I'm, I'm really angry about something. Something's happened, and it's, and it's caused this anger to kind of well up inside of me. Or it can even be sadness. So just get in a comfortable place and and think about a feeling that's been awfully big in your world right now. If it helps, imagine that feeling as like a color or a shape. It could be an object. Look at the texture. Look at the size. Pay attention to the color that this, this emotion summons up for you. Once you're able to do that, I want you to take some time to think about an appropriate container for this feeling. Something that's, that's strong enough, that's big enough, that's resilient enough to hold this feeling for you right now. Some people have chosen something as small as a mason jar or a thimble. Other people choose something as big as the galaxy in space. Just think of something that could contain this this emotion for you right now. Now pay attention to the the container. Notice any special colors, any decorations, or just its rustic simplicity. 
Notice how big it is and how resi- it's resilient enough to hold your feeling right now. Next, I'd like for you to imagine moving that shape, that color, that feeling into that container. Allow it to move at its own pace, not forcing the movement, but encouraging it as, as needed. I want you to notice the moment where you feel like that container has, has completely contained the feeling that you're working on containing right now. If it's a transparent container, notice looking at that feeling through, through whatever it is. Or looking down through the lid of the container, noticing that feeling. It's, it's there, it's safe, it's not going anywhere. It's not hurting anyone, it's important. And we're gonna take some time to just be curious about that feeling and notice its containment right now. And just notice when you feel like it's completely contained. Next, I want you to think about how you'd like to seal this container. Does it need a lid or something to tie it shut or, or something stronger to contain the feeling inside? just there to hold it in place just for for these moments right now. So imagine sealing your container. Then think about if you need need help sealing the container. Maybe choose someone from your life that you see as a strong support. Be a hero, a family member, a mentor, a teacher. Someone who you see as a strong person in your life. It can be uh, an image from your faith tradition, a character from, uh, from your faith that you see as, as strong and powerful that can help you hold this feeling with you right now. And as you notice that feeling, just contain, just take a few deep cleansing breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Now that feeling is there for you to go back to any time you want to. And notice how it's right there and it's small and it's contained enough. Notice if it needs to tell you something, if it's trying to inform you about something that's going on in your world right now. Feelings are so very important. And you can let it know that, that you'll be back to take a look at it any time that you need to. And if you'd like to make it a little deeper, you can do your butterfly hug just to let that, that containment feeling feel a little bit stronger. Or else just take a few more deep breaths. And when you're ready, let your attention kind of come back into the room. All right. Very good. Nice job, guys. How you feel? Ready to learn? Brain clear? I'm telling you, learning happens so much better when we've got a calm mind in a calm space. This actually comes from some EMDR training. It's a, a, a trauma-informed uh, style of therapy that, that really does look at how we deal with our feelings in the here and now. And uh, it's, it's a pretty powerful exercise to do. It can be tough though. Sometimes the the feelings are just so big that they're tough to get contained. And that's okay too. That might be informing you something about the strength of the emotion and it's something good to pay attention to. But this is something great to try if you're noticing you've had one of those days and you just need things to kind of get in a good space where you can get calm. Just taking a, a five minute break to go and do this container exercise can maybe get you in a good space. It's also something you can work with your kids on, your kids who might have some really, really big feelings at times, All right? This is a great visualization you can help them with to help look at, at that. Um, yeah, do you have a question? We did have a question coming in from Junction City. Okay. Um, it was a little bit earlier, but they were asking um, if you're gonna be talking um, a little bit more about if a child, um, how to help a 
The question is, will you be addressing a bit more about how to help children who are clingy and um, are feeling disorganized? Ooh, so kids who are feeling clingy and disorganized. Yes, absolutely. We, we will get to that. I don't know if we're going to hit that this week as much, but we will definitely hit how our response to those kids um, can impact their ability to work through that clingy feeling. So it definitely starts with a calm parent, um, and we, we will get really, really good at that tonight. And, um, and I will come back to that one. Um, I'll come back to that one shortly. Okay. So here we are. We're, we're going to look at the second part of getting to know yourself tonight. This is the, the week about the brain, the body, and the nervous system. Um, so we're going to get to know how stress impacts your body and how you can leverage that knowledge to be able to, to do your absolute best as, as a parent. And wh why is that important? Why is that important for us to be able to regulate ourselves when we're dealing with kids who have trauma? I, I want to, yes, absolutely. Our calm is contagious, right? Our dysregulation is also contagious. So being able to, to get a good idea of what's going on inside of us is absolutely what needs to happen for our kiddos. And I want to kind of share a little bit uh, from, from history about this. And um, some folks who did a lot of work, um, there's a great book called Creating Sanctuary by Sandra Bloom, who uh, kind of illustrated this unique point in, in history of treating people who've experienced trauma. She describes a clinic that, that, uh, that really tried something radical in treating people who are coming back from the Vietnam War with a lot of post-traumatic stress. And, and they recognized a phenomenon that they called the sanctuary trauma. What happened was people came back from, from the front lines of war seeing just horrible atrocities and we're going to look at, at what that does to the brain and the body in the next couple of weeks. But, but uh, they had this, this syndrome of symptoms that made life really, really difficult. So they, they, they knew that the front lines of war were awful. But then they came back home, and home was really, really hard too. And there were a lot of things that, that triggered a lot of the traumas that, that happened in war. So home didn't quite feel safe either. So, so there's one loss of a safe place. So sometimes things would get so difficult that they would end up hospitalized. It's like, finally, the one place where they'll actually get me, right? They'll actually understand this trauma stuff. Um, however, at that time, um, the, the, the treatment centers, the hospitals, were kind of these cold, rigid, and sterile places. And they didn't understand all the ins and outs of trauma. And the staff were horribly burnt out and we're dealing with really, really tough jobs, underpaid, overworked, and their stress levels were very high. And the rules and the routines were, were as such that they were difficult for a lot of these men to, to deal with when they came back. So, so finally, the place they say, go to the hospital, that'll be the safe place. The, the kind of the final straw, the hospitals were traumatizing. And so this is what she coined as sanctuary trauma. That one place I can finally go to for safety and sanctuary is now lost. So now, where is safety? It's nowhere, right? It's, it's nowhere to be found, which leaves people in a really, really desperate situation. Um, so a lot of clinicians got together and said, you know what, this is not good enough. We, we need to do something different here. So they tried creating a different kind of therapeutic environment a place that wasn't so cold and wasn't so rigid and built in themes around autonomy, like doing things for yourself, making your own choices, doing things around having um, kind of these peaceful and meditative sorts of, of, of places that, that Im impacted, that influenced community. And community was really emphasized there. And also the, the, the clinicians were, were cared for and they realized that the clinicians felt different working in an environment like this. They were more calm. They were more at peace. And they found that that was really one of the deciding factors in these people getting well. And, and actually being able to treat the trauma was creating a place of sanctuary. Now I want you to think about this for, for kids who have experienced trauma. Kids who have been like on the front lines, you know, seen some bad stuff. And they, they come into to our homes sometimes. 
and think about, you know, that's, what, that's what this is all about, is creating sanctuary for these kids. Creating an environment that, that's big on, on building community and building structure and building attachment and building connection where there's choices that can be made and community that's built and trust that's built and where the caregivers are cared for and have a good sense of a peace within themselves and are able to not just push their feelings down, but be able to work with those feelings and regulate their feelings well. And think about creating sanctuary within your own homes for kids who've experienced trauma. So that's why we, we really look at this stuff around the brain is, is that part around care for caregivers, being able to have some tools, being able to understand that, man, this stuff really matters. And the, and the stresses that you experience are very, very real. And caring for kids who've experienced trauma is very challenging. And if there's anything that we can do to lighten the load and to make a little bit more sense about what's going on, I say all the better. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. So some things to think about as we're going further is, have you ever wondered why it's hard to think clearly when feeling sad, angry, or, or worried? You ever notice that? When you start turning up the temperature emotionally, what happens to our clear thinking? And have you ever noticed your body doing a kind of weird stuff when you're under stress? You notice kind of the, the tightness in the chest or the pounding in the head or the gut. We're going to figure out what exactly is going on there and have some steps to be able to, to do something about that as, as it goes on. So as we're bridging the gap, we're going we're gonna to look one more time at attachment and how it impacts our stress levels and our triggers as parents. So I want you to watch this video. This is a video from Circle of Security. Uh, anyone familiar with Circle of Security? Awesome. If you are, great. If you haven't heard of them, look them up. They're great. Go to the websites, go to the trainings, talk to some of the people who know about this because they've probably got some great things they could share with you about Circle of Security. So take a look. Parents, throughout history, we've struggled to get it right. We hope we won't pass on our emotional issues to our kids, and we swear we won't make the same mistakes our parents did. We all have great intentions, but something seems to get in the way. Let's look at what that might be. At Circle of Security Parenting, we believe that being emotionally available to our children and their needs is the key to doing our best as parents. We call emotional availability being with. It means teaching emotional intelligence by being with our children in all their feelings, like sadness, joy, anger, curiosity, pain, frustration, excitement, and so on. Being with children helps them understand, trust, and move on from feelings. And knowing someone is with them in their feelings helps children feel less overwhelmed and more secure. Decades of research backs this up. For parents, some of this comes easily, but other times our children express emotions that make us uncomfortable. So we pull away or try to overrule their feelings, which leaves them on their own. We do this because our children's feelings can trigger strong emotions in us. We think of it like this. Our history during childhood of how core people responded to our different emotions creates the background music for how we experience our children's feelings. Let's look at this example. This girl and her father have been enjoying time together in the park, but suddenly aware of the time, dad says, we need to go. When the girl hears this, she starts crying and gets increasingly angry. All at once, the dad's background music changes. The background music that is playing for the father right now, we call shark music. As it turns out, the dad's own mother was uncomfortable with loud displays of emotion, and she didn't know how to handle them. So throughout his childhood, she repeatedly told her son it was pathetic to cry, and she never ever asked him about his feelings of sadness or anger. His ability to deal with his daughter's emotion now is greatly affected by the experience with his mother then. Sharp music, we're rarely aware it's playing, but it's our past experiences telling us to be afraid of 
or uncomfortable with a feeling or need that is actually safe. When our shark music limits our ability to respond to these feelings, our children learn to hide or feel ashamed of them. This is a problem because we're teaching our children to fear emotions that are actually both safe and essential in life. Most of us experience shark music with one emotion or another, and it's different for everyone. But whenever it is triggered, our ability to respond to our children's needs is limited. The good news is, by simply calling it by name and reflecting on what our children need in the moment, we can turn down our sharp music. This is so important, because if we can learn to manage our history of negative experiences and perceptions, we can respond to the truth of our child's current situation and be with them in it. Ultimately, this will help our children grow up with a better ability to understand and share more of the emotions they experience. There's no escaping it. Strong feelings are a challenge to manage as parents, but our children always benefit when we have an accurate response to what's happening, rather than reacting to the sharp music we're bringing into the relationship. Remember, there's no such thing as perfect parenting, and blame never helped anyone feel more secure. That includes blaming ourselves. But the more often we can identify our sharp music, the better off our children will be. Catch those last moments there? I, I hope so. Um, you didn't ask for your shark music. These are things that have happened to us. And, um, but we can get to know it better. The more you get to know it, and I love that metaphor. It's, it's again, it's, it's playful, it's easy to remember. It's one of those things you, you can remind yourself, oh, this is that shark music thing happening. This is what's going on here, and you can recognize it. And that's a first step. And, and working through and having a greater experience with your kid is recognizing your triggers. So now it's your turn to talk. What I'd like for you to do is, is uh, get into groups of, of two to four, and I want you to talk a little bit about this together. I want you to talk about, so there's an activity on page 18 that I'd like to, you to look at and discuss. What, what are your triggers? What's your shark music? What are the things that just kind of set you on edge? What are those, those things that happen? So as you're discussing, think about these two questions here. Um, are, any sim are any triggers similar to other people in the group? Do you recognize you might have some similar shark music as other people? And the second thing I want you to think about are any success stories in recognizing your triggers. Your shark music, your attachment history. So times you've noticed, oh, I'm triggered, and I might need to take some steps to, to get things in a good place. So go ahead and take a few minutes, discuss, and um, we'll call you back in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I, <laughs> I love seeing you all talk to each other. This is good stuff. This, this is really where the magic, <laughs> the magic of being here happens. So what, what do we notice, folks? Um, oh, and I, I, I want to mention this also. For folks viewing online, these times when we're doing the group discussions would be a great time for you to go ahead and just work on your workbook in these the, and, uh, and use those as cues to talk to other people about some of these things as well. So does, does anyone have anything from their group that they felt like they would want to share? Anything about triggers or anything? Yeah. We were talking about oh. um, different... Oh. Hang on a sec. We'll do it. get the mic. Do I stand up? Sure. <laughs> so uh, my name is Joseph. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, we were coming up uh, with different um, problems that come up when you are triggered. Yes. Okay. And we were thinking that that might be why. It's kind of a question. Mm -hmm. Why people turn to like alcohol or drugs? Sure. Because it stimulates or depresses Absolutely. the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want something to deal with that trigger, right? Um, and, and honestly, the best case scenario is you go to a relationship when you've got distress, when you have emotional distress. If you have someone to connect with, um, that's fabulous. If you have some attachment wounds and going to a relationship is hard, of course, what else do you go to? 
anything that makes the pain a little bit less, right? So I think you're, you're absolutely right. And that is a lot of the roots of, of addiction, um, specifically with people who've experienced trauma, is that it's something to help the pain feel a little less painful. Um, but, but boy, relationship is a great healer for that as well. And ideally, when we're feeling triggered, that's the idea. We're, we we want to get to relationship. Awesome question, awesome thought. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Moving onward. So we're going to start at the very, very basic level of stress. Before it's a conscious thought, before it's even an emotion, it starts right here. Does anyone know what this is? This is a nerve cell. Fantastic. Um, you have so many of these in your body. Um, all throughout your body, you have a huge amount of them up in your brain. So there's, there are so many of these connected to each other, and, and they, they actually do. They, they start forming chains one after another after another because um, the, the nervous system likes things to be streamlined. It likes taking these little shortcuts, and they, when, they wire, when they fire together, they wire together, and they survive together. It's kind of the language that a lot of the neurobiologists are using, talking about how this stuff works. They form these chains. So you've got an amazing cluster of them up in your brain, but they also cluster at different places. You've got a cluster around your heart. So there's this cluster of nerve cells that, that are around there. And then you've got another cluster down in your gut area. Um, and they're, they're all taking in information all the time. Every single thing you see, taste, touch, smell, all of that is, is causing this synaptic firing to happen from one neuron to the next, to the next, to the next. And as long as everything is, is fine, as long as things are predictable, this is usually a pretty smooth process, right? And, and you'll recognize this in, in things like muscle memory and things that you've done a thousand times and you just know. Or has anyone had that phenomenon where you're like you're driving home from work or somewhere that you go a lot and, and then you get home and you're thinking, how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> right? That's, that's your brain kind of going on autopilot. It loves, it loves shortcuts. So it's, it's got this kind of neural network happening and, and they get really smooth and they go really fast when things are pretty predictable. When they're not predictable, um, you're going to get some action happening here those neurons are gonna start sending different messages to the different parts of your body, letting you know that something is wrong. If we were all in here, and everything's calm and peaceful, right? Feeling pretty good, and we started smelling smoke, right? That's, that's a sensory thing. Pretty soon, it's gonna start sending some messages really quickly to your body that you're not gonna be feeling so calm and peaceful anymore, are you? alert. Some, something is happening. And now if we, we, you know, someone comes in and says, hey, don't worry, they were cooking some cookies over there and they left the oven on too long, that's what's going on. Then we would be okay again. It's like all's back to normal. But if we start hearing fire alarms, what do we do? We, we jump into action, right? So I want to mention this vagal nerve here. Um, anyone heard of the vagus nerve? Yeah. So it's the longest cranial nerve in the body. And I want you to pay attention to the areas that it moves its way through in the body. So it starts up in the roof of your mouth, goes up into the head area, right? <clears throat> then it moves down into the, the heart and the lungs and down to the gut, all the way through kind of the core of your body. This is one of those excitatory nerves that, that it, it regulates the state. Are you at an alert state or at a calm state? And, and it's got all those parts of you connected. So this should start making a little bit of sense to you in terms of where do you feel your stress? And recognizing that when those, those messages are coming into your body, it may be triggering different parts of you. So learning to pay attention, are you a head stress person? Do you carry your stress? Is that like your, your primary early warning system is, oh, that tension, I feel it, there it is. Or are you a heart person? Do you feel that tension there? That vagal nerve goes right through there. Do you feel the pounding, the tightness that's there? Do you, are you a gut feeling person? You, you know, that the churning and the, the distress that, that happens down there. Um, you have that, that gut feeling, 
there's really something neurobiologically to that, that there's those cluster of nerves down there that, that get excited when things are a little bit out of whack. So, so learning to pay attention um, that, that this is your body doing what it does. It has an amazing ability to perceive stress and respond to it. Um, and when there's real stress there to be responded to, you're really glad that it's there. So I'm gonna mention a couple, of, a couple more systems where it's gonna get a little bit more sophisticated than just nerves. Because once the, the nerves start sending those messages that something's a little bit off here, um, if there is distress, your sympathetic nervous system is going to fire. I use my little icon of the, the race car down there. It's like a, a car revving its engine, just ready to go. And this is a very fast response. It's, it's called like, it's like an electrical s current going through your body. It's, it's a very, very fast system. This is actually called the, kind of the hot cycle. It's an immediate response to, to distress. I want you to pay attention to what is activated within the sympathetic nervous system as well. Some things are going to start happening. Your eyes are going to get sharper focus, dilation of the pupils. You kind of lose your periphery when you're under stress, right? You get that razor focus on whatever it is that's causing the distress. That is a survival mechanism of our body. We, we need to be focusing either on our exit strategy or the thing that we're gonna have to fight through to get through the moment. Um, inhibition of the flow of saliva. Our mouths get dry when our sympathetic nervous system fires. You will know this if you've ever done any public speaking. When you get up in front of people and you notice, oh my goodness, I feel like sandpaper in here. That's your sympathetic nervous system. And honestly, it's kind of saying, there are way too many eyes on me right now. This feels a little bit threatening and it's your body's natural response to that. The, the heartbeat is going to accelerate. It's gonna start pumping blood through your system rapidly. And it's shooting that blood and that oxygen through to those large muscle groups to get you ready to respond to the threat, right? And the, the same thing with the lungs, short, shallow breaths. It's like it's pumping air as quickly as it can to get out all that oxygen to get you ready for your fight or flight. Um, and as that, that happens, it's gonna trigger the endocrine system, which is kind of the cold cycle. So it's gonna start sending some chemical messengers through your body. These are slower. This is not that fast electrical impulse. This is a slow and slow response. So you might get something called cortisol going through your body. This is a stress hormone. Cortisol is good stuff in the right context. When you're feeling stressed, Cortisol is there to, to give you that extra momentum to get through that stressful moment. In that moment, it helps you. It helps you survive. When there is constant chronic stress, cortisol actually becomes toxic to the body systems. So stress over extended periods of time floods the body with cortisol constantly and, and the body doesn't like that. And if your body is constantly under stress, eventually the brain kind of turns off the faucet and says, no more, this stuff is killing you. Which leaves you in a bad spot the next time you're under distress because that cortisol that you need is not there. This is why taking care of yourself is super important. Long-term chronic stress floods you with cortisol and it actually over time depletes your, your cortisol so you don't have it when you need it. Also adrenaline, everyone heard of adrenaline, right? That's that, that kind of fight chemical that's there. It's like, okay, it's fight or flight. And then you hear about people like pulling the doors off of cars to save people, that's adrenaline. And in short bursts, again, it's great. It's good to help you survive, but, but not good, good long-term. I wanna mention this. So this, this sympathetic nervous system, it can go on really quick and then it can go off really quick. The cortisol in your body stays around for a long time. As a matter of fact, they, they, um, after a couple of hours, half of it's gone from your body. Then another two hours, half of that's gone. And it really takes like six to eight hours for all that cortisol to leave your body. So think about this, if you've had a real blow up with your kiddo and they've had a really rotten morning and they go off to school, they've still got all that cortisol 
flooding their system. Same thing with you. If you've had a really rough moment and then you're trying to do something else afterwards, recognizing, boy, I've got all that stuff that's just floating in there that's, that can be tough to deal with. So when the fight response, fight or flight response is necessary, it's great to happen. However, um, we need the body to be able to calm down as well. That's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. So I, the icon I use for that is like a parachute. Think about that. You know, the, the race car is the sympathetic. The parachute is the parasympathetic. It slows everything down. It calms everything down. Yes. Also, I have a daughter who freezes. Yes. Like yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you just, so freeze, that's, that's a good question. Freeze is actually a survival technique as well. It's, it's telling the body, I've got no context for this. You know, fight or flight, it's like, okay, I know to either fight or to run away. Freeze is like panic. It's like, this is so bizarre, so unusual, so unpredictable. I don't know what to do. So, and, and your body gets flooded with sensory information. It's like more input, more input. Give me more information so I know, so I know what to do here. So I know if I'm able to, to uh, if I need to run off or, or not. You see this in animals also. Sometimes when they're being chased, they'll flop. You know, and it's that, that um, maybe I'm not what you want after all. You know, and, but then it gives the body enough time to kind of recoup and know what, what's going to happen next. So freeze, yes, absolutely. But parasympathetic, that, this is different than freeze. This is calm. This is all of those systems that were firing before, the, the, the heart rate and the lungs and the pupils. You, you start to get your vision back, and you can start to see the periphery again. You start to be able to take larger, deep breaths. Your heart starts to slow down. Everything is, it's like that your body gets the all's clear signal, right? So if we're smelling smoke and we feel like, okay, we're going to have to run for our lives, sympathetic. Someone comes in, completes the story, gives us a full detail. No need to worry here. We were just baking cookies. Everything's fine. Parasympathetic fires. Everything starts to calm down. And all of a sudden, we're back here and we're ready to learn again. We're in a good, we're in a good space. So like I said, in the right context, it's a great thing. Recognizing all of those systems in your body firing is super, super important uh, because it can feel like life or death sometimes when we're dealing with our kids. It can feel like fight or flight. And if we can recognize I've got that fight or flight thing going and then put it in context, this is my child, right? They, they, they need me and, and I'm gonna have to be the one to get things into a calm space here. So what you can do is actually kind of um, coerce or encourage your parasympathetic nervous system to, to fire. If you can recognize this is the wrong context here, this is not a fight or flight, what I need to do is get that parasympathetic nervous system to fire. So there's a few techniques for you, and these are things you can teach your kids as well. So the first one is the magic mustache. Everyone find your little divot above your, above your uh, lip there, and press and hold it for 10 seconds. While you're doing that, feel the breath on your finger and release. Wanna feel okay? Good. It gives you something to do. Um, also the m massage, the brain stem, right? Find that little divot behind your, where your neck meets your skull and kind of just give yourself a little bit of a massage there. That's kind of giving that signal. It's, it's just, again, an action you can do to say, okay, I need, I'm gonna calm here. I'm gonna get myself regulated, get myself in a good space. Those are also really disc discreet. You know, I'm like, I'm thinking, hmm, what next here, right? Or I've I'm, I'm got my, my divot, ah, what do I do here? Another thing is, um, so, so this, I, I use the metaphor of, of switching to autopilot. Sympathetic nervous system is like a plane on autopilot. It's just going, right? No rhyme or reason, it's just going straight and it's gonna keep going straight as long as it's got fuel to go straight. When you recognize that you're in that airplane, and your airplane is going straight, but it's headed towards the side of a mountain, what do you need to do? You need to grab the manual controls, turn off the autopilot, and steer it a different direction. So these next few things are thinking about um, kind of taking the manual controls back from your body, letting your parasympathetic nervous system happen almost by, by you choosing to let it happen. The first thing is clench fists 
are a sign of sympathetic nervous system happening. This is fight or flight, right? You're either going to run or you're gonna punch your way through whatever that threat is. It's natural for you to clench when you're feeling threatened and feeling distressed. Think about how this looks to your kids, right? It's natural, it's normal, but think about someone this high looking up at their grown-up whose sympathetic nervous system is making them breathe really shallow and have squinty eyes and clenched fists, right? Not good. So a spreading of the hand is something that can help. So if you recognize that, that, um, that you're, you're feeling distressed, and this is a skill that, that's taught from um, Marshall Linehan's Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. It's, it's, it's just doing a, a simple spreading of the hand to let your sympathetic nervous system know it's, it's gonna be okay. See how different that looks? Look, I'm here, I'm here to learn. I'm here to hear from you, right? And it lets your sympathetic nervous system chill out a little bit. Deep, deep breathing. That's manual controls. Your sympathetic nervous system is making it really shallow. Manual controls means you're slowing it down, taking big, deep tummy breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. If you'd like, you can even put a hand over your heart and over your tummy and just notice that sensation of the rising and the falling, listening to the sound of your breath. Square breathing, where you breathe in for three, hold for three, out for three, wait for three. See how, how regulated that is. That's you using the very best of your mental regulation and your mental f faculties to know, I've gotta get things back under control here. You're taking manual controls and you're getting your, your parasympathetic nervous system to fire. Um, I have a lot more suggestions. I'm going to send those out through, um, through the email this, this coming week. Um, so be looking for that. I've got one page of 40 suggestions and one of 10. So you'll have 50 self-regulatory calming strategies coming your way. Watch out for your inbox there. All right. So, man, we haven't even got to conscious thought yet. We're still just like an automatic action here. So now we're going to do, we're going to explore the brain. We're going to get into all the different parts and, and what they do. And I want to mention why this is important also. Um, so a metaphor that I've, I've thought about that came home to me today was thinking about having a really great car. All right. So you've got this car and it's got all these features and functions to it, but you're kind of just using it to go from here to there. You know the basics, right? You know to put gas in it. Maybe you know to change the oil, but you know that you, know, you push this pedal and it goes, this one, and it stops, and you've, you, you're able to get to work or to the park or to the movies or wherever you're going to go, and you're just kind of getting by with it, right? Um, but this car has so much to tell you. It's got so much that it can do if you take a look at it. So I've got this little symbol on my dash that, that lit up a couple of days ago. It's like a circle and it has these little squiggles at the bottom. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Um, it looked like it was probably important, but I didn't know what it meant. Anyone know what that sim symbol means? Tire pressure. Tire pressure. That came home to me today as I was over at work and one of my coworkers came knocking on my door saying, Corey, you've got a flat tire. <laughs> Had I known what that symbol was trying to tell me, I probably could have done something better. But it gets even cooler. So I go, I go to my car, and, and I reach for the, the spare tire. I reach up. This is I, the first time I've had a flat in this car, and I reach down. There's no spare tire in there. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is really weird. I remember buying my car, and I remember you know, thinking it's got to have a spare tire. And I'm kind of rifling through where the spare tire should be, and there's this really cool box in there. It's still got the plastic on it. Never been opened, and there's this little canister that's with it. I'm like, wow, what is this? So there's some instructions that are there, and I pull them out. And, and what it is, is it's like this electric tire filler. And it, like, shoots the sealant into the tire, and it gets you where you need to go to get your, your tire change. And I'm thinking, man, I've been driving this car for, like, two, almost three years with all of this great stuff in there. <laughs> And I never knew to access it, right? I didn't even know that it was there. So sometimes taking out the manual, 
getting to know your car can help you have better functioning, better maintenance, better use of your car. Had I known, I would have felt great. I'd be like, I got that cool electric thing. I'm going to plug it in and it's going to take care of me. Um, but I didn't know. Same thing with your brain. Your brain is an amazing organ. It is so phenomenal. It can do so many things. Getting to know it better can help you have better functioning of your brain, better maintenance of your brain. You might notice some of those, those, those early warning signs that come on and learn to pay attention to them a little better just by getting to know your brain. That, that's why we spend so much time on this is uh, knowing your brain is power. It gives you choices. It gives you more, um, more options out, out of life. So that's, that's why we explore the brain. So we're going to look at three main parts of the brain. You don't really have to memorize these, and we've got a lot of great metaphors to help you know what they are and what they do. Our first part we're going to look at is our upstairs brain. This is kind of the, it's, um, some people will call this like the green zone. Um, Becky Bailey, who does uh, conscious discipline that we're going to look at in a few weeks, and even Daniel Siegel that looks at the brain, he, they kind of agree this is like kind of that green area, um, not that it's colored green, but it's like it's, it's something to think about. Our, our green brain is our frontal cortex, our cerebral cortex, with a crowning achievement, the prefrontal cortex. Its job is thinking. Higher level thought, reasoning, logic, problem solving, learning ability, uh, being able to d make decisions and awareness. What the frontal cortex wants to do is learn. It wants to figure things out. It wants to problem solve and talk about it. It wants to, to, uh, to get through things that, that are tough that come your way. It is a great part of your brain to access when you're working out things with the people that you care about and when you're planning for things in the future. And when you're assessing, are things going well or are they not? We need our logic and our reasoning to be able to, to do that. Now we're going to take a trip down further into the downstairs brain. This is like the, the limbic region. There's lots of parts within the limbic region. But this is called like the, the blue zone of the brain. It's blue because it's really emotional. It's got lots of feelings. This is the part of our brain that, that regulates attachment, emotion, connection. This is our feeling centers of our brain. It's like all the stuff that's happened before and how does that make sense with what's happening right now? Even being able to perceive how others are feeling around us, being able to, to recognize um, how others might be feeling and do some, some self-regulation around what do I need to do next. It's super important. What it wants is to feel loved and connected. It wants to know that it's like that it feels respected, loved, cared for. All of those functions are it's someone out there that I can trust, that I can care about. All of those feelings live, live there in that blue zone. And then down in the basement, we have the brain stem. So if you are here tonight and you are alive, you can thank your brain stem for that. <laughs> this is the part that controls our heartbeat and our breathing, our awake and our sleep states. Um, this is the, the survival part of our brain. Its whole job is keeping us alive. What it wants to know is very, very basic. It wants to know, am I safe? Am I safe right now or am I not? So you got that upstairs, thinking, green brain. Downstairs, feeling, blue brain. Basement is our survival. It's our red brain state. And we will, you know, all of these are super important. They all have jobs to do, and, and they've got their functions. And then we're going to make it even a little bit more complicated here. Because even within our, our cortex, we have our right brain and our left brain. Our left brain is kind of the literal, logical, linguistic parts of our brain. Linear thinking, the letter of the law. List making. <laughs> the left brain loves that all of those things start with L. It's just very black and white and it's functional, right? This is like our math and our facts and our black and white concrete literal thinking lives in our left brain. This part of our brain is really important. Um, when I go to someone to do my taxes, I want them accessing that part of their brain. I want them to be very clear and rule bound because that kind of thinking is super important sometimes. 
So it's the black and white, the lines. Now, now our right brain is kind of more of the figurative. It lives in the land of, of emotions, images, instead of like language, it's more like pictures and ideas and sensations. It looks at the, the figurative meaning of things rather than the literal meaning of things. Um, it's the big picture, kind of the, the spirit of law. This is kind of our, our artistic, our creative, our imaginative part of who we are. Um, that part is really important also. When I'm watching a good movie or reading poetry, I want someone who's accessing that part of their brains. I want some of that imagery and the, and the feeling and the emotional part of it. So you see how they both have their, their jobs that they can do. And you've heard about being, you know, I'm right-brained or I'm left-brained. You know, we're, we're, we all have both halves of those. And they both have the jobs that they can do. However, sometimes we lean more one direction or another. So here's our, our hand model of the brain. This is a great one you can show your kids as well. So Dan Siegel came up with this. Um, so this, our, our, make a fist wrapped around your thumb. This is the model of your brain. So we've got our upstairs is, is the fingers that are right here. Our downstairs is your thumb that's inside. Your, your cortex is wrapped around your limbic system. And then your wrist is the basement. That's your brain stem. So there's all the parts. So you can recognize all those states, our thinking, our feeling, and our survival. So integration is a word that's used when we're, we're talking about how the brain works. Integration means all of those parts are doing what they're supposed to do. And they're talking to each other. So our upstairs is making sense of our feelings downstairs and maybe motivating us to action in our basement. So they, they all work together. Every part is important. Our left brain is important. The facts are important. And our right brain is important. The feelings. So we have those feelings that are happening and, and we need to make sense of what to do next. So we need, we need all of those happening. So integration means that they're all working together. So the opposite of integration is disintegration, right? From everything just kind of, they stop talking to each other. The, the upstairs brain sometimes leaves, particularly under stress. When stress hits you, it knocks off your, your frontal lobe. And at that point, what are we left with? Yeah. We're left with feeling and we're left with survival. Which when we're trying to solve problems with our kiddos and we've lost logic and reasoning and we're left with emotion and left with survival, um, this is probably about the worst place for us to be in terms of a problem solving. This is where, where sometimes when uh, we, we, we're really getting into it and we, you know, we, uh, our, our kids are dysregulated and we are too, and we might come up with these things that we feel like are great consequences, like you're grounded for the next six years, right? Which to this brain sounds totally reasonable, right? Because you feel and you're really ticked off and you feel like this is what we gotta do to get through this. And then your, your frontal lobe comes back down and says, you idiot, what have you done? <laughs> Don't you realize we're the ones that have to follow through with this consequence now, right? So, so being able to, to um, use all of those is, is helpful. So there's, when stress knocks out the upstairs, we do with the hand model, what Dan Siegel calls flipping our lid, right? We've lost our lid. We've lost our wise prefrontal thinker and we're left with feeling and survival. So I want you to think about this. So your kid is upset, frustrated. They flip their lid. By the way, their lid is still forming. Their frontal lobe is not fully formed until like after age 25. So they're dealing with less hardware up here. And if you've had a kid who's experienced trauma, we're gonna find out in the next few weeks, this part of the brain is way more active than this part of the brain. And there's less connection between the feeling centers in the brain and the logic centers. So we've got a kid who's got less hardware and maybe their trauma has impacted so their lid flips a little easier. Then you've got a grown up with a flipped lid, right? And now you're trying to fix this problem. Not a good space, right? 
You're upset, they're upset. Not a whole lot of good is happening here. And if you follow them, that dysregulation, like I said earlier, is contagious. They feel it. And, and they're going to say, their, their sympathetic nervous system is going to say, you see, I was right to be afraid. I was right. And, and I'm going to go to fight or flight. And we're just going to either you know, dig in our heels or we're going to duke this out. And this is not going to, because you know, kids who, who have experienced trauma, they want, it, they want that safety. And they'll do anything they can to get back to it sometimes. So what do we need to do when we're here? We have to be the ones, not them. As the parents, we have to be the ones who get ourselves regulated. Because this is also contagious. When, when we regulate, it sends the message to that limbic system and to that brain stem. You know what? This grown-up's okay. They're safe. This is going to be okay. This is going to be all right. Maybe there's a lot of other things that have happened that make me really distrust this right now, but, I, but I'm, I'm this much more likely to, to get my lid back home. This is a phenomenon known as co-regulation. You regulate first, and they follow. So how do we do that? <laughs> oh. First of all, it's, it's recognizing, is, is my lid flipped? If you can recognize it, that, that's really good. Um, the next thing is, is recognizing where, where am I at right now? Um, there's, uh, so so if, if you sometimes have this flipped lid phenomenon or you're under stress, you might go to your dominant side of your brain as well. If you're left dominant, you might go to what's called the left brain desert, right? It's dry. It's void of feelings, but boy, there's a lot of language and a lot of logic. This is where lectures come from, right? It's our left brain desert. Here's the facts. Here's the rules. Let me tell you 10 more times until you get it, right? Um, which, if a kiddo is in the, the right brain tsunami, they got none of that, right? They've got no language. They're, they're feeling like this is just really unfair, right? Right? And so sometimes if we're stuck in our left brain and our kids are over in the right brain, we can drive them further into their right brain just by us staying over there in the left. And we're going to find some tools in the next couple of weeks to, to help bridge those gaps as well. But recognizing, you know, you may be a right brain tsunami person. You may not be the left brain. You may be the kind that, that when you're under distress, it's all feeling. It's all emotion, there's tears, and there's, and there's loudness, and there's lots of things that happen. So recognizing, is my lid flipped? Am I in a left brain desert? Am I in a right brain tsunami? Recognize the state that you're in. E even recognizing those, the, you know, the green brain, blue brain, red brain. Where, where am I? C can I think logically? Can I think rationally? Um, what can I learn? If you, if you recognize I'm in this state, I can be curious, I can wonder what's going on, I can think about the potentials and the possibilities. Um, or, am I in my blue brain? Blue brain is very, very vulnerable to insult. So if you have kiddos who know how to use words really well <laughs> and know how to, how to push the right buttons and we feel that insult, that's that the recognizing, ooh, I'm in my blue brain right now. I've kind of lost green brain, and I'm down in the blue where I'm feeling. I'm feeling a lot right now. Or have I gone even further down? It's gone beyond just the feeling, and now I'm down in my red brain, survival. Am I, am I going to, is this a crisis? Do I need to just feel safe? What do I need to do? All of those are important. Recognizing what state you're in is even, is even more important. So what do we do? First, we, wanna, we want to parent from a place of mental integration. We want to become regulated. So the, the first thing that, that I'm going to recommend is finding those recharge activities. So we're going to split back up into our groups, and we're going we're gonna to look at what do you need to do to, to help regulate your cortisol levels, your stress levels, your frustration. Um, so think about what are your recharge activities, but also, I want, number two, I want you to think about who are your personal supports. This is also on page 18. So who do you go to when you need this to happen? You need a listening ear to get you back into that green brain. So take, take just a couple of minutes here. 
another like four minutes and get back in your groups and talk about what do you do to recharge? What do you do to get yourself regulated and who are your supports? Go for it. Okay, let's pull it back in. I, I would love to hear some ideas, some suggestions. <laughs> what, what do you got for me? What, what are some things that uh, anyone want to share, some good ideas around? What, what do you do to self-regulate? What do you do to help get yourself in that, that kind of recharged sort of state? Walking. Walking. Awesome. Very, very good. Uh, any sort of physical exercise? actually helps reset your cortisol levels. So it kind of is a natural way to get you back in that place. Has anyone ever felt that when you go for a walk or go to exercise, especially like before work? And then you're like, man, I can do anything right now. I feel great. It's like that, that kind of that good regulations happen. Physical exercise is wonderful. Also helps with mood regulation. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Ooh, loud music. Yes, I'm good. <laughs> I play my guitar really loud. Awesome. Music is a yeah. great way to regulate. A great way to kind of, especially loud music, yes. let yourself just, yeah, <laughs> let the lead out, right? Awesome. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, we were just saying it's, it's hard to get away um, just by ourselves or maybe do some of the things yes. that we really like when we're home all day with our kiddos. Mm -hmm. um, but we were just saying just getting outside yes. and fresh air, even if it's raining, just yep. kind of helps everybody. Like it can be mm -hmm. crazy in the house and you're like, it's going to be an ordeal to get everybody <laughs> outside. Yes. But for some reason you get outside and it happens for all of us. So. Oh, wow. So yeah. giving yourself a reason to get outside yes. is, oh, I like that. Just catch that. Which, which kind of reminds me of our rescue respite list in the back of your book. Keep filling those out. Make some connections. Find someone that can get you out of the house during a day. Right? Have a reason to go do something. Wonderful. Anyone else? Excellent. Those are really, really good. Um, so we're going to move into this last phase here, looking at kind of a technique. Something you can do. So we've got our kind of our basic regulation skills. Now we're going to get a little bit more sophisticated. When you recognize the flipped lid, when you recognize the emotions are running high, some ways to kind of work with this. This, this kind of works along the, 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 um, the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy that looks at the connection and the interplay between the things that we think and the things that we feel and the things that we do. Our doing is very hard to change. Changing behavior, changing our, our kind of response to things can be really difficult. Um, Changing the things that we feel can also be very, very challenging. You want to just tell, oh, just stop being mad. Stop feeling mad. Don't feel so, it, it's not that easy, is it? Those feelings are important. They're letting us know some things. So kind of our entryway into changing some of the ways that we, we feel and some of the things that we do is really working on in the thought level. So we're going to access that good frontal lobe, that green brain to be able to, to work through this. Because again, our brain wants to learn. Just asking yourself a question, what do I feel, is a green brain activity. You've got to access language. You've got to access some reasoning, some logic. This is the word that represents the feeling that I'm having. And that's, that's sometimes enough to pull you up out of that blue brain and get you thinking in a different way. So just asking yourself a question is, is a good place to start. But we're going to walk through this whole model here. This is called the STOP model that, that Carolyn Rexy has kind of developed over at CAFA. That's a, just a good way to walk through how to, to uh, regulate ourselves when we're feeling really, really strong feelings. So it starts over here. Our, our red heart over there represents kind of our, our self-value. This is, I, I'm loved, I'm respected, I'm in control. I'm connected to others. One or more, sometimes all of those things are very, very important to us all of the time. And as long as you are feeling loved and respected and connected and kind of somewhat in control, usually things are, are pretty good, right? Not a whole lot of bumps in the road until we get those arrows in the heart. Once a problem happens that problem generates a dip in those feelings. All of a sudden, 
Um, we, we take offense. We feel insulted. Our value drops and kind of the opposite of those feelings happen. We might feel unloved. We might feel out of control, dis connected, disrespected. Those are the things that happen when we're having a conflict with someone. If we ask our kids to go do something and they do it, we've got that good red heart. We're feeling loved and respected. If they don't, we feel one of those other feelings. Once that dip happens, our emotions emerge. Um, And these are different for every person in every situation. For some of us, anger will emerge. Others, sadness, worried, Fear, anger, any of those things may be happening depending on how we interpret what just happened with our kiddo. When that happens, we want to assign blame and explain the pain. Why am I feeling disrespected? Why am I feeling unloved? This is not something that I like to feel, right? So our natural response at that point is to, is to kind of protect the self. We have that impulse to, to protect who we are that kind of ego defense mechanism, we wanna protect and guard the self. Which if we take the low road, and that's represented by kind of blue brain, dominant emotional thinking, or even red brain, that fight or flight, that's gonna land us in some, some possibly not so good situations. This is where a lot of times poor choices will happen when we're dominated by that, when we're in conflict, if we're dominated by emotional and survival thinking, we go down to some things like aggression. We wanna get bigger, we wanna get louder, we wanna get control, withdrawing, uh, stonewalling, we're gonna dig in our heels, these, da- these, these behaviors that, that damage. And for kids who have experienced trauma, this is where things get um, a little different because we, we our impulse may think, well, if I just get bigger and stronger, I'm gonna scare them into doing what's right. These are kids who have already been scared. It doesn't always work that way. And as a matter of fact, it might reinforce some of those negative beliefs that they might have. Taking that low road can end us in a really, really bad spot with, with our kiddos. It can end up with really problematic um, relationship things happening. So the high road, this is where we're going to get into that green brain thinking. This is where we're going to access the best parts of who we are intellectually, our logic, our reasoning, our problem solving, our creativity, all of that great stuff that lives up there. But we have to, we have to do something sometimes to get there. We got to stop. We have to have a grounding moment. Even just recognizing I'm out of my green brain, I've got a flipped lid right now, that's, that's your trigger, that's your symbol, that's your little early warning symbol that I ignored in my car. It's that thing that says, hey, stop. We gotta do something here. We gotta change the energy of what's happening here. Um, so finding something to ground yourself in that moment is gonna be really important. And that's gonna be able to a- help us access kind of our, our curiosity. What am I feeling? Why, why am I feeling this way? We might go back to our shark music, right? Ooh, this is one of those things that, that triggers because of how things were with my mom when I was a kid or my dad when I was a kid. Or it, it might go back to our kind of our attachment style. I'm feeling like super avoidant right now and, and they're not giving me my space and I'm feeling this, this conflict. So we've already got some, some tools for your curiosity, some places for you to go. There are usually good reasons why you feel what you feel. Access them. What is it that I'm thinking right now? What is it that I'm feeling? Then you're gonna be able to to go into this place of empathy because you're gonna take that same sort of creativity and think, what's going on for them? Is this their trauma? Is this their developmental level? Is this their personality, their temperament, their attachment style? What, What is it that may be going on for this kiddo? And you see how different that is than just, just the anger, or just the feeling, just the survival. We're, we've got something to work with now. We can, we can get creative and we can maybe do some problem solving. So our, our grounding event, um, Carolyn's like a, a, she likes visualizing the stop sign. She's a visual person. And for other people, like seeing the word stop, seeing it three times flashing. Um, for you, it may be taking a walk around the block. Um, a a mantra, a prayer, something that you say to yourself to get yourself in in a good space. 
finding something to stop that inner, even just walking out of the room, taking a deep breath, changing the scenery, changing what's going on around you is sometimes enough to get yourself in that grounded space. Then you're going to take some time, identify the feelings. What am I feeling a dip in right now? Do I feel disrespected? Do I feel unloved? Do I feel disconnected? Um, what am I feeling in response to that? And then you're going you're gonna to opt to give yourself the benefit of the doubt. I've probably got some good reasons why I feel this, right? This, this makes logical sense why I would feel this. Um, and we're also going to give our kiddos the benefit of the doubt. This is, goes back to our basic philosophy, kids do well if they can. If they had the tools and the skills to get through the moment, they would be doing well. They may be missing something. It may be the trauma that's triggering what's going on here. So, so this, this is where that place of curiosity is so, so very important. Get curious about yourself. Get curious about your kids. Ask a question. Explore. See how green brain all of that is? Right? We need that higher level thinking to be able to do that. And that's going to give us what we need to help connect with all of those feelings. Because our, our green brain is going to say to our blue brain, yeah, I get why you're feeling that way. And, and it's going to kind of give some soothing to that. And it's going to help that insult to feel less stingy, less, less hurtful. And it's also going to tell our, our red brain, hey, chill. We're good. We're, we're, this is a kiddo I'm working with. And they've got some hard things that have happened to them. And I'm here to help them work through this. I know I feel insulted. And it feels like just the worst you know, insult that I could feel right now. But I'm going to be able to step over that um, because I know that my kid's doing the best they can. And I'm going to be the one that's going to regulate and get myself into that calm, good space there. So this is kind of how it happens. There's little Sally. You, know, you ask her to go clean her room, and she does it with a smile on her face. And then she brings you flowers, and isn't life grand? Isn't it good, right? What are you feeling then? Feel loved, you feel respected, like, you know, everything is pr pretty good. Then you ask Billy to do the same, and he shouts some choice words back at you. <laughs> or keeps playing Xbox, or anything besides going to clean his room, right? In come the feelings. If it's an anger response, we feel insulted, we feel disrespected, we move to anger. We've got a flipped lid. We might have some thoughts that go around with that flipped lid like, what, what a brat, <laughs> nobody treats me that way. That's that, you hear how self-protective that is? And that's that blue brain saying, uh-uh, right? Like nobody does this. Um, you, you stay, you're in charge, you're the grown up, they're the child, all of those sorts of things. And it may even progress further. This is where escalations happen when our kids, when we dig in and they dig in, this is where our meltdowns really, really happen. If we go there and we might end up um, just getting, you know, shouting or aggressive. This is where those unreasonable consequences were taking all the electronics out of the house and shipping them off to somewhere else, right? And then, you know, because our, our blue brain said that was a good idea, right? Not a good idea. Got to get regulated. Now, another thing may happen also. Let's say, let's say we go to just that blue zone. Let's say the feeling is sad, right? I asked my kid to clean the room and they didn't do it and I just feel crushed. Because maybe this is like the 18th thing I've asked them to do this day. And I just feel like, boy, I'm, what, what's going on? Am, am I a terrible parent? See, what, what's being asked here is, are they a rotten kid or am I a rotten parent? This is that blue brain thinking it wants to blame and it wants to shame and it wants to do all those things that aren't really useful. They're not helpful, right? So if it's I'm a terrible parent, we go down to the blue brain, we're just shut down, we disconnect. And this is where we start distancing ourselves from our kids because that pain hurts and we don't want to be around that. And this is where we start thinking about placement disruptions and we start thinking about difference in, in our, our case plan and we might start thinking about these, these sorts of things because it's natural when we feel so upset and we feel so disrespected sometimes. So, so um, what do we do? <laughs> We, we've got we to recognize that those kinds of words that we say to ourselves represent blue brain or red brain thinking. We need to access our green brain. So we're going to ground ourselves, right? We're going to do something to help ground in that moment. We're going to take our deep breaths. We're going to do the things that get us back in that safe space. And we're going to disrupt 
that thought. And then we're going to start getting, getting curious. And we're going to start making sense of this. We're accessing our green brain. We're making sense of the story. It's no longer, they're a rotten kid, or I'm a rotten parent. We're able to, to logically look at this and say, this is a kid who's had a rough go. They have had a hard life. And, and these behaviors that are so hurtful, they, they start to make sense. And they start to, you can put it in the right context. And it doesn't excuse it, and it doesn't make it feel less painful sometimes, but you start to, to get the reasoning behind what's happening here. And, and it gives you a place of empathy to be able to, to move forward. And ideally, you're going to, to remain calm at this point. Our grounding is meant to calm us, to regulate us, to get us in that good space. We stay present and secure. We might have to go back to our own security when we're dealing with kids with insecure attachment. This is why I had you talk about the people who give you security in your lives. Who do you go to? You might have to, to even remind yourself, I am a lovable person. I really, really am. And I've got these great relationships and, and this stuff that's happening does not impact that. I'm still that. It's just that this thing, this trauma thing that's happening is really coming up against that. So, so you lean on your security and you lean on your stability and your resources. And you know what? The kids see that and they say, wow, they're kind of unshakable here. They're, they're kind of, you know, they get upset and they get frustrated, which you will because it happens, but they don't stay there, Right? They're able to move from a place of, disre from, of regulation, where things are calm, to dysregulated, I'm really upset, and then move back into regulation again. This is really important for our kids to see this. This helps the parts of their brain that develop self-regulation to form and to become stronger. And for sometimes, this is a brand new thing for a kid to see, wow, it doesn't stay in that red zone or they don't go to that blue zone and want to just be done with me, they're able to be strong and secure and be able to, to work this out. Um, and they borrow our calm. And I want you to think about this. Any intervention that you do, any consequences you choose to give, any rules, any structure, anything that you're, you're trying to do to, to change the, the behavior of your child, it all starts with a calm regulated parent, the very best interventions. When, you, when you're trying to, to intervene and give consequences from a red or a blue brain, um, it's not gonna go so well. Give yourself some space. Give yourself some time to regulate and get back into that good space um, before you start giving those, those consequences there. So I'm gonna end with, I've got a video here from, from Dr. Dan Siegel that talks a little bit about um, how this works with kids who've experienced trauma and parents. Most people are doing the best they can. Not everyone, but most people do the best they can. And when you bring that positive regard, then even a parent who's abusive to a child can be understood with empathy and compassion. So that many parents who themselves are providing the terrifying experiences that lead to disorganized attachment have themselves experienced all sorts of trauma and loss. And if we just look at an example, you know, let's say a child is um, asserting herself of not wanting to uh, have her father brush her teeth, let's say, and the father himself was uh, the unfavored child and was beaten as a child when his siblings weren't. Um, and he gets an experience now as a father where the um, child says, you're not going to brush my teeth, only mommy's going to brush my teeth. And he says, no, I'm going to brush your teeth. When the child says, no, no, it's mommy, a couple of things are going to start happening. The kind of memory that's embedded in our nervous system that isn't woven into a narrative of who we are, so in this guy's case, the feeling of abandonment by parents because they favor the other siblings, the feeling of terror of people coming after you to beat you in general, but especially when they're supposed to be protecting you. Um, all that kind of betrayal, humiliation, abandonment, 
that can be embedded in what's called implicit memory. It's the emotional, perceptual, bodily memory, sometimes behavioral memory. It, it does what's called priming the brain for readiness to act. So at this moment, when his two-year-old daughter is saying, Mommy's going to brush my teeth, not you, this father's brain, if it has unresolved trauma, which in this case we're describing, the implicit memories will become activated. Now, at that moment, he could go down a couple of routes. One is purely reactive, which he feels humiliated by his own daughter. I should be a competent father. Let me brush your teeth. She goes, no, 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 you don't know how to do it. I can do it. I can do it. So that sense of incompetence as a father brings up humiliation that then resonates with the humiliation from his own childhood. So it can trigger that directly like that. The mirror neuron system of the father can also pick up the anger of the daughter because it goes both ways. So the father's mirror neurons are soaking in like a sponge the daughter's anger. You can't brush my teeth and she's showing this anger. That's going to trigger in a mirror neuron way his own anger. So now he's got humiliation, abandonment, betrayal. The daughter gets more and more angry at him for his insisting and maybe he grabs a toothbrush and tries to start you know, brushing her teeth and maybe she bites his hand or who knows what's going to happen there. And it can go extremely quickly from a father saying to his daughter, you need to brush your teeth, to within 10 seconds, a father out of control. And the out of control are all these activations of implicit memory, all these mirror neuron soaking in of present emotional resonance with the daughter. And then because he has a history of disorganized attachment, this father, if he hasn't worked it through in therapy, he will be prone to the low road. Now, once the low road starts to happen, of course, with all this implicit subcortical memory being activated at that moment, all the subcortical resonance of the mirror neuron system happening at that moment, it shuts off prefrontal functioning and that what it's going to happen is he is going to be let, letting loose an evolutionary onslaught of, in one case, if he collapses in hopelessness, he may just start crying and fall down on the floor and scream. He may get fearful and just run away. But even as likely is he'll get angry and hit his daughter that he'll be so enraged at the assault on his sense of self, the cortex is offline, that he will become not only verbally abusive, but potentially emotionally and physically abusive to her. Powerful stuff, right? A lot of words, but it's, you know, if we're out of our upstairs brain and we're in that low brain, blue brain, red brain, we're more likely to do things. So this is, you see why it's so important to know yourself as a parent. Know your history, know what's happened to you, know what's, what's your, your past, your attachment, and understand what's happening in your body. Recognize that some of this stuff is automatic and you might have to be able to, to, uh, to make some choices to get into a better space. So, so better awareness of brain activity equals better actions with others, with, with our kids. And I want to leave you with a quote from Dr. Bruce Perry, who's kind of the world's leading expert on trauma. He says, relationships are the absolute heart of humanity, and we are neurobiologically designed to be in relationships. We are neurobiologically designed to be able to read and respond to other people, and we are neurobiologically designed to reach out and seek relationships with other people. We're made for a relationship. This stuff is so powerful and, and we, we uh, interact with each other and knowing ourselves is gonna give us such a better place to be able for our, our kids to do some healing. So um, wrapping up, think about your, your own awareness to your brain, your body. Um, know what's triggering you. Take some time to, to identify your early warning systems. Recognize the thoughts and feelings and sensations related to your nervous system. Keep yourself healthy, locate your supports, participate in self-care, and when in a crisis, get curious, get grounded, stop. <laughs> find a grounding activity, find ones that work for you, and connect with your whole brain to be the best possible parent for those kiddos. Think about your action steps. This week, it's all about recognizing 
your green brain, your red brain, and your blue brain. So, so take some time this week to think about that. Do you notice yourself moving from state to state? Do you notice what it takes to get yourself back into a good space? Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's actually an action. But, but take some time thinking about that. And uh, next week, we will start looking at getting to know our kids better, looking at some developmental um, structures and processes, things that happen, and getting to know what's going on in the world of the child.